Welcome to the next video, the topic solving a quadratic. And we're going to do this by both graphing and by factoring. You can see here we're going to start with the graphing side of this. This side you should be a little bit more familiar with yet. We haven't done too much factoring and for some of you maybe you haven't factored at all. So we're going to start with the graphing side. This should be very familiar where we have our x which is our input or our domain and then we'll be looking for a y our output so again if you've watched other videos on this I like to always start with zero it always gives you a good idea of what's going on with your picture and zero is usually the easiest point to plug in because when you square zero when you multiply anything by zero when you add zero, all that, the numbers don't change at all. So when I plug a zero in here, zero squared is zero. Seven times zero, zero. Zero plus zero is zero. And so when x is zero, that means the y value or our, our output is 10. Then normally I try small positive numbers. So let's try x being one. And when I plug a one in, that math would look something like this. And again, if you've tuned into some of my videos in the past, you know I like to plug everything in using parentheses, especially if you're using your calculator. You could type all of that in directly into your calculator and you would get the right answer, or you could probably do this in your head. 1 squared is 1. 7 times 1 is 7, and the 10 is unchanged. When I add all that up, I get an 18. And so that would mean when x is 1, y is 18. So when I start to graph these two points, 0, 10, that can be graphed. 0, 10 means I'm not going anywhere left or right, and I'm going up 10 on my y-axis. Being that 0, 10 is all the way up there, I don't think I'm going to be able to fit 118 on here. It'll probably run off my page. So that means I'm going to stick a way of continuing of plugging in positive x values and we're actually going to switch already to some negative values. So if I plug a negative one in, again I'm going to show the math for this because it can get a little tricky here. I would certainly use my parentheses, be very careful, plug that negative one in. This time you get a negative one squared and sorry not to confuse you that's not a negative sign this was just an extra line of work. Here's my new input value. So negative 1 squared is a positive 1. 7 times a negative 1 is a negative 7 plus 10. That all equals out to a positive 4, meaning when I plug negative 1 in for x to this equation, I get a positive 4. So that would take me to negative 1 up 4. Now if you also remember from our videos in the past, I see that squared sign, I'm thinking immediately some sort of U-shaped picture. So this could be my U coming down and then hopefully coming back on the other side. So we got to keep going. Let's go ahead and plug in negative 2. I'm going to walk through this one. You should either pause the video and do this work on your own or plug it into your calculator. Hopefully some of you have already started. But I'm going to just talk this one out loud. If I plug a negative 2 in for X, negative 2 squared is 4. 4, I'm going to add it to the other positive number right now, 10. 4 and 10 will give me 14. And then 7 times a negative 2 is a negative 14. And so a positive 14 and a negative 14 would cancel out. And so when I plug a negative 2 in, I get 0. Negative 2, 0. So it looks like I'm still going down on that U shape. Hope, hopefully we will turn around soon and start heading back up but I haven't found that spot yet, that vertex, the low point here, so I need to keep plugging in points. Looks like I might actually end up at running out of room, so we're going to start with negative 3. I might have to continue this table somewhere else. But for right now, let's plug in negative 3. Again, negative 3 squared is a positive 9. 9 plus, well, 7 times negative 3 is a negative 21. So 9 and 10 is 19. 19 plus a negative 21 would give me a negative 2. 
that would mean I have the point negative 3, negative 2. I'm still going down, but the points are getting closer and closer. Notice the gap here a little bit further than the gap here, which is a little bit further than the gap here. So I know I'm getting really close to turning around soon. Let's go ahead. Like I said, we need to continue this chart down here. X on my left, Y on my right. We got to try a couple other values. Let's go ahead and try negative 4. If I plug a negative 4 in, negative 4 squared is 16. 16 plus the other positive number 10 would be 26. And then 7 times negative 4 is a negative 28. So negative 28 plus 26 gives me again another negative 2. So I have indeed started to come back up. That would mean my vertex is probably somewhere right there. It's definitely going to be in between negative 3 and negative 4. So I can make a rough estimate that it's going to be certainly lower than those two points, probably right around there. If you would want to, you could start plugging in negative uh, rational numbers that are not integers, like negative 3.5 or negative 3.75 but I don't think it's necessary. We know this graph is starting to come back up again. Let's just try to find one more point. Let's go ahead and plug in a negative five. If I plug in negative five, negative five squared is 25. 25 plus 10 is 35. And then if I multiply this seven by a negative five, I have a negative 35, which again, means I'm going to cancel everything out. When I plug a negative 5 in for x, I get 25 plus 10, which is 35. 35 minus 35 is 0. So when I plug in a negative 5, I get 0. Negative 5, 0 would be this point over here. I do indeed start to get that U-shaped picture. And so let's go ahead and make a rough sketch here. Looks something like this, which means... That would be my graph for y equals x squared plus 7x plus 10, a quadratic that you're going to start to become familiar with. If I kind of just avoid that y right now, instead of making this an equation, if I just call this the expression x squared plus 7x plus 10, this is going to be an expression you are going to become very familiar with. And we're going to show you how to factor and what we can tell by factoring. because. There's two points when graphing, the x-intercepts and the y-intercepts that are very helpful and can be very beneficial, especially in higher level math courses when to trying to determine things when this would turn into uh, something students don't like, uh, a word problem. So these x and y-intercepts can become very beneficial. Y-intercept, easy to tell, where the graph crosses the y-axis. So that was this point 0, 10. The y-intercept would be 0, 10. The x-intercept, sometimes there's multiple x-intercepts. We actually have two. It would be where the graph crosses the x-axis. And they were at negative 2 and negative 5. So I have two x-intercepts, negative 2, 0, and negative 5, comma 0. But sometimes the graphs aren't this easy, and maybe you didn't even think this graph was that all that easy. And so I'm about to show you another way and to introduce factoring, a way that you might be able to find those x-intercepts a little bit quicker. So the second part to this video, solving a quadratic by factoring. Okay? So, again, just like I showed you last time, let's ignore that y equals for right now. One method of factoring, and eventually will become a shortcut for you, is to try and determine what factors of 10, factors meaning two things that multiply, what factors of 10 also add to give me 7. If you're familiar with the factor by grouping method, that's when we've had that known 1 and I multiply the 1 by 10, and again, I'm looking for what two things multiply to give me 10, but also add to give me 7, 
so that I would be able to break that center piece up into four terms so that I could factor it by grouping. So think about this. Factors of 10 are 1 and 10 and 2 and 5. Well, 2 and 5 also happen to add to 7. So eventually, if you know this already, the shortcut means I know this factors as x plus 5 and x plus 2. So now let's carry down that y equals, because this is still an equation. So y equals x plus 5 times x plus 2. And now I have two things called factors. And that's why this method is called factoring, because I've just created factors. Factors multiply to give you some number. Now, if you remember from our graph, the x-intercepts were both had something in common. They both had a y value of 0. And that is always true about x-intercepts. They always have a y value of 0. So I could use that information to help me find my x-intercepts. If I know the y value is always 0, I could go ahead and plug a 0 in for y. And now I could solve this. Now, you might not know how to solve this right now. There's a rule called the zero product property. And you might not know this property, or maybe haven't heard of it before, but you certainly will understand it. What the zero product property stands for is, I know if I multiply two numbers together, let's say five and you know the other number is a zero. You know when you multiply two numbers together, one of which is always zero, you know that your answer is zero. And so the zero product property works backwards in the fact that if I know my answer is zero, that means one of my factors has to be zero. There's no other way in math to get a zero as my answer. So that means either x plus five equals zero or x plus two equals zero. One of those two has to be zero. So I can solve. I've got two equations. If I subtract two, that means x is equal to either a negative two or x could be equal to a negative five. And if you remember, those were our two x-intercepts from before, negative 2 and negative 5. You can make your own decision, but I feel like when you start to become better at factoring, this is the much quicker way to find your x-intercepts. Once you become a factoring master, finding your x-intercepts will become very easy for you.